and we're going to be talking about the idea that we are in a battle. Watching war movies is like one of my favorite things as far as movies are concerned. If it's got fighting, if it's got action, uh, I'm locked in. I really enjoyed um, the Band of Brothers series. I like watching documentaries on World War II. That's probably like my favorite time frame for, you know, watching war type of, of stories. But I'm a sucker for war stories. I'm a sucker for heroism. I think it's men that are willing, men and women, that are willing to lay their lives on the line and sacrifice the most precious gift that we have being our own lives for us. I think it's one of the greatest acts of love that you could possibly do. Greater love has no one than this than to lay down his life for his friends. But a lot of these people, they lay down their lives for people they don't even know. And so I have great respect for people that serve in the military and who sacrifice their lives for us. And I thought about them, you know, over uh, this July 4th weekend as I watched a really cool um, celebration down in D.C. on TV. I thought that was awesome. Uh, and so our church is so grateful for people that serve uh, in the armed forces. And we have a lot of people in our church um, who have not only served but have actually stepped foot on the battleground themselves. And we are so grateful for them. But for those of us who haven't actually stepped foot on the battleground, that doesn't mean that we aren't in a battle ourselves. And I've got good news and I've got bad news. The bad news is, is that we all have our own battles that we fight. The good news is, the war that we're in has already been won through Jesus Christ. And so while we fight and wrestle against ourselves and the advocate um, he pleads with us on behalf before God. We still fight not only against our flesh, but also against an enemy who is very, very real, and his name is Satan. And I think one of the greatest tools of Satan is he has convinced our culture that the idea of him existing is absurd. I mean, when you think about Satan, the thing that probably pops up in your mind is this little red devil with a long tail and horns on his, on his head that people dress up at Halloween time, and it becomes something that is laughable. And the world doesn't take Christianity seriously or Satan seriously because the very idea of him is silly. And if I was your enemy, that's exactly what I would want you to believe. I would want you to think that I'm no one to be taken seriously. I'd want you to think that I'm a joke. I'd want you to think that I don't really exist and I really don't have any ill intentions for you or for your life or for the people around you. But that is absolutely not true. Famous theologian Warren Worsby said this, The Christian life is not a playground. It is a battleground. And we must be on guard at all times. You know, the enemy that we face is very strong, very experienced, very knowledgeable, has been around since the beginning of time, has watched you, has sent other people that are on his side to look at you and observe you, to see your strengths and your weaknesses, to see where you're strongest and at the times that you have the most weak spots in your life, to see what you care about and what you can't stand, what pushes your buttons, what really hurts you, what really helps you. And he has orchestrated this battle plan against you. He has schemed, is what the Bible uses. He has schemed against you because he wants you to fail. And here's his goal. If he can win one battle and then another one and then another one, he can get you to give up the war to reject the victory through Christ. And so last month while we talked about if I'm busy doing spiritual things, I won't be doing sinful things, that has to do with our battle against ourselves. There is another battle that we face, and that is against this enemy. The art of war puts it like this. The supreme art of war is to subdue the enemy without even fighting. And so if I can convince you, if I'm Satan, if I can convince you that I'm a joke, the second thing that I want to do is convince you that you're not in a battle. I want you to focus on the end, focus on the war, and convince you that you face no battles yourself, that I'm not really working against you. And there are a lot of people in this room and a lot of people in this world who are convinced that they don't have any battles that they face. Well, that's simply not true. Dr. Tozer, he's a famous theologian, he put it like this, the idea that this world is a playground instead of a battleground has now been accepted and practiced by the vast majority of Christians. And so he wants to convince you he doesn't exist and there is no battle. But we know that's not what the Bible teaches. Paul put it like this in Ephesians 6. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil, the traps of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, 
but against rulers, against powers, against the world forces of his darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness in heavenly places. You know, the book of Ephesians, or the letter to uh, Ephesians, was written predominantly to the church at Ephesus, but our oldest manuscripts actually don't have the letter being addressed to Ephesus. It's not, it's not written anywhere. And so probably what happened is they took this letter, predominantly meant for the church at Ephesus, but they would take these letters and they would circulate it to the Christian community. And so it certainly meant something to the church at Ephesus, and we're going to talk about the context of this letter. But most importantly, these are things that were written to this church that we can apply to ourselves. And so what I want us to do, to, to do this morning is I want us to recognize what the battleground is for us, and I want us to be set on ready, readying ourselves for the battle. Recognize the battleground and ready for battle. You know, I asked myself the question this week, what kind of battles did the church at Ephesus face? And when you actually look at the city of Ephesus, it was one of the most prominent, well-known cities in the Mediterranean Sea. It had a seaport. And so it was a very wealthy city. People would travel in and they would travel out. They would sell their goods there. And so it was a very popular, very wealthy city. They had this huge amphitheater that would sit thousands and thousands of people. And so they were really focused on entertainment. I mean, that kind of sounds a lot like our culture, right? America is probably one of the wealthiest cultures in the world, if not the wealthiest. We have a heavy focus on entertainment. But this is the most important thing about the city of Ephesus. The city of Ephesus had a temple, and the, the goddess that reigned at that temple was called Diana, and she was the goddess of sex. And the way that they would worship this goddess is through sacrifices and prostitution. And so they had a stronghold in the city of Ephesus. It wasn't just about materialism. It was about sexual worship through prostitution. You want to tell me the city of Ephesus doesn't correlate to what our culture struggles with today? Materialism and greed sexuality, worshiping a false idol through sex, and then money. Ephesus was obsessed with demonic arts and possession. They had this religious cult that John actually talks about in Revelation 2, and here's what this religious cult sought to do. You cannot do anything without the hierarchy of this religious cult. You're not allowed to worship, you're not allowed to serve, and the people who are in control are the religious leaders and so they thought that they could get power through being in charge. You want to tell me that's not a lot of religions today? People who are in charge have the power. Some of the most wealthy organizations in the history of the world are religious movements. And you can research those online. And you know when the, when the Apostle Paul, he preached the gospel here in Ephesus, the book, book of Acts describes Paul's journeys. And when he went to Ephesus, he started preaching Jesus as Lord. He talked about the resurrection of Christ. And they actually began to riot against Paul. And here's why. People began to convert to Christianity and they stopped buying all the goods that the religious craftsmen had to offer. They would make these idols out of silver and gold. And Paul, through the preaching of the gospel, he impacted their pocketbook. And they screamed at Paul for over two hours hours. Great is Diana of Ephesus. They screamed at him and rioted against him so much that he actually had to leave Ephesus. And before he left, he warned the elders of the church, watch out because people are going to try to corrupt the church. Ephesus is us. And so when we think about what they dealt with, we need to apply this to ourselves. We need to watch ourselves and be careful that the church doesn't get infected, that we don't get infected through the tactics, through the battle plan of the enemy. The terms of the battleground are known, and I want to share a few of these with you this morning, because you cannot fight a battle that you don't recognize that you're in. You can't win against the enemy if you don't know how he's scheming against you. And so for the church at Ephesus, I think we can apply these same things to us today. The most important fight that they would go against, that Paul warned the elders against at the church at Ephesus, was a battle of false doctrine. Doctrine means teaching, so false teaching. Their principalities, their ideas and principles and thoughts and philosophies that are absolutely false. They say things like relative truths, or we refer to these things as unbiblical teachings. Here's what they are. False doctrine is this. They are false statements about reality which do not reflect biblical, historical, or relative truth. It is an idea or a teaching that contradicts and nullifies and takes away from God's word. 
Now, Paul, he not only wrote the book of Ephesians, but he also wrote some other letters to some people to one young man named Timothy. Can you guess what congregation Timothy ministered at primarily? It was the church at Ephesus. Timothy had to set apart elders and teach and ordain and minister and evangelize. And here's what Paul told Timothy as he ministered to the church at Ephesus. He says, if anyone advocates a different doctrine and does not agree with sound words, those of our Lord Jesus Christ, and with the doctrine conforming to godliness, he is conceited and he understands nothing. He has a morbid interest in controversial questions and disputes about words. So it's all semantics, in other words. Out of which arise envy and strife and abusive language, evil suspicions and constant friction between men of a depraved mind and of a, of a deprived truth, who suppress that godliness, who believe and suppose that godliness as a means of gain. Here's why false doctrine is one of the things that is the most important aspects to the battle that we face, because it does four things to us when we live in a false way and we believe things that are false. It causes us to live in a conceited way. It causes us to live in an ignorant way. So we're not only conceited in our thoughts, but we're ignorant of truth. It causes us to live a life that is very controversial. We're always at war and arguing and battling the people around us. And then finally, it causes us to live in a very unholy way, something that contradicts God's godliness. And so let's look at that first one. He made it clear, false doctrine, false teaching leads to conceited living. To be conceited is to live according to the principles of your own knowledge, of your own mechanisms in life of your own way that you do things. It's either your way or the highway, and everything that you believe is your truth, and everything that everyone else believes is their truth, and no one can tell you what to do. Very proud and conceited. You never ask this question, what can I learn? Where can I grow? You think you've reached the top. You know everything there is to know about life in the Bible, and so there's no reason to go to Bible study. You don't need to listen to sermons. You just believe what you believe. Paul says, False doctrine makes you conceited. The second thing that he talks about is what's called ignorant living. He says to those who advocate false doctrine, he says they understand nothing. They're foolish. They don't live in wisdom. They don't live skillfully. Their thoughts are not thought out, in other words. This is the danger of false doctrine, is it causes us to be proud and it causes us to be ignorant of what is true. Well, number three, Paul made it clear that doctrine leads to controversial living. Discussions become nothing more than semantics. And we hear stuff like this all the time. You have your truth. I have my truth. You hear things like this. That may be true for you, but not true for me. You have your truth, and I have my truth. But here's the question that we should ask ourselves. Is that true for everyone? Is it absolutely true that your truth is my truth, and my truth is your truth? Is it absolutely true that what's true for you is true for me? Well, absolutely not. Here's the problem. These kinds of statements are not only contradictory, but they're self-defeating. If your truth is your truth, and my truth is my truth, and that's true for everyone, it can't be true. But yet, we are proud and ignorant of what is absolutely true, and we fall into this trap of living a life that contradicts itself. But this is what is popular philosophy today. I mean, all you have to do is look on social media, and you'll see these kinds of things popping up, and we have to reject this kind of thought process. You know, I was in a discussion with a friend of mine, and we were talking about truth and morality, and here's what he said. You ought not to force your religious views on others. You can't expect everyone to follow your religion. And I returned with this question. Does everyone have to follow the idea that you just stated? Does the religious viewpoint that no one should be forced to accept your religion? Is that the standard that is to be applied to everyone? Because you're telling me I can't put my religious views on you, but you're putting your religious views on me. Why is that fair? When we ask these kind of questions, when we analyze this kind of false approach to life, we come to the conclusion there is a such thing called truth. There is a way that we ought to live. There is this thing called morality that we have within our hearts that we should live by. The problem is, is we don't want to live by it. You know, when we think about this kind of living, it eventually leads to unholy living. And that's what Paul told Timothy. He says, look, when you've got people who are conceited and proud and controversial, they get in these semantic arguments that are self-contradictory, he says, out of these come envy. 
Envy is rejoicing at the misfortunes of other people. It's a very wicked sin that we fall into. We actually celebrate when other people fall and fail and sin. That's, that's not good. He says strife. That means they love to argue. You know anybody like this? I mean, they constantly argue on Facebook or Instagram or Twitter or online or maybe even at your workplace. They're always looking for a, a fight. Well, if people are always looking for a fight and they're completely contentious, maybe even in your own marriage or in your own family, they're probably conceited and ignorant, and they live this kind of contradictory lifestyle and and these ideas that ultimately flushes itself out in unholy living. He says they'll have abusive language. This is slander. They will call what God considers evil good, and they will call what God considers good evil. You want to talk about something that is relevant in our culture today. This is absolutely relevant. The things that are good of God have now become evil to the world, and the things that are evil are now promoted and are good. Well, that's an obvious indicator that something is wrong in the thoughtful level. He says evil suspicions, and maybe this is something that you struggle with. You always believe others have evil motives. Do you struggle to trust people? Do you always believe someone's got a certain angle that they're trying to work? Or they have something to gain, or they're trying to manipulate the situation and take advantage of you. Man, that living in that kind of life is torture. But that's what happens when we believe false doctrine. He says constant friction. Greeks, they use this word in classical Greek literature to refer to sheep. Sometimes sheep, they would get scabs or cuts or wounds. And the way that they would deal with that is they would rub against other sheep. And you know what the problem is when you rub your infection against something else? It spreads. And you know what happens when you live with someone who's in constant friction with the people around them? It spreads. I mean, we all know people probably in the church, at our job, and our family. I mean, we don't even want to be around that person because it's always drama and it's always friction. Well, that's what happens when we believe false doctrine. And then finally, he says this, they will use godliness for personal gain. You know, Jesus and his church are not to make you healthy and to make you wealthy. And we see on TV, in our own experiences, we see people using religious truth for personal, financial, power type of gain. And that is sinful. We approach Christianity through, what does it have to offer me? What can I get out of this? And for those of you who work on our welcome team, this is something that we often confront in our welcome team. People shop churches because they're looking, what's in it for me? What's the best thing for me? And that's something that we have to deal with as a culture. But there should be warning signals that go off in your brain. Do I approach Christianity this way? Do I deal with any of these sins that have worked itself out from what I believe to be something that is true but may actually be false? And so I hope that your mind is well aware, this is a tactic of the enemy to get you to believe something that is false because everything is built off of what you believe to be true or what you believe to be false. It starts at the doctrinal level. We as a church, we strive to preach what is true. We strive to protect and guard the sacred truths that we find in the Bible, but not just in the Bible, but in reality itself. Just like the example I gave you earlier. Is it absolutely true there is no such thing as truth? Think about it. Is it absolutely true that there is no such thing as truth? Is it absolutely true that all truth is relative? These are the kind of self-defeating statements that we need to run from as a church, that we need to run from in our own minds. And so, first and foremost... The act of of Satan is to get you to believe false doctrine. Well, what about Ephesus, right? They confronted false doctrine, and the idol that they worshipped is Diana, the sex god. What idol do we worship today? You see, the, the, the methods are the same. The gods have changed. Do you know who the idol of the 21st century is? Us. Ourselves. Believe what is true for you not what is true to God or to reality. What's the second thing that they dealt with? Not only false doctrine, but materialism. Look, Ephesus was a very popular, wealthy city. They would not convert to Christianity because they had something to gain from it. I already gave you the example. You can read about it in the book of Acts. Paul went, and when he preached the gospel, they drove him out of the city because they started to lose their own money. I want you to think about yourself. How far would you be willing to follow after Jesus? 
Do you make spiritual decisions based off of the money in your pocket? Do you make biblical decisions, family decisions, based and circled around money? Has following Jesus ever cost you anything? Well, they struggled with materialism. What is materialism? It's simply this. Material possessions are the most important. And here's the bad news. If Satan can actually get you preoccupied to be busy with material things, you won't be busy with spiritual things. Jesus put it like this in Mark chapter 4. But the worries of this world and the deceitfulness of riches and the desires for other things enter in and choke out the word and it becomes unfruitful. When you think about yourself and God's word working in you, ask yourself this question. Are the material things in my life choking out God's influence? Am I more busy with material things than I am with spiritual things? Are material things evil? Absolutely not. It's when they go beyond their intended bounds. The boundaries that God has set up with sex or material things or doctrine, it's when we use these things in the wrong way. And so we might wrestle against the, the, the God of materialism. You know, the moment you decided to attend a, a life group or a Bible study, what usually pops up? Something else. If you own a home, the moment you decide, look, I'm going to give something to God, what usually happens? Something breaks that you have to pay money for. When you finally say, you know what, I'm going to church every Sunday, all of a sudden your boss decides to change your schedule at work. Do you think these things are coincidences? Do you think these things just happen by chance? Absolutely not. There is an enemy that is at work against you and against me who wants to seek to destroy you, to win these small battles. And so the moment you try to say, look, I'm going to be busy with spiritual things, your enemy is working against you and you are ignorant and foolish if you don't think you are in a battle for your soul and for your spirit. The third thing that they struggled with, there's a difference between materialism, but then we also have greed. Greed is a strong, selfish desire to have more of something. To be greedy is to have an unusual pleasure from having more and more, and an unusual sadness when you lose. It's like the man I discussed last week who thought about committing suicide because he missed out on a great investment. I mean, think about that. If I can get you hooked on wanting and having more, I can distract you from the things that matter the most. You won't give. You won't be charitable. One of the greatest things that you can do in this life is to love other people through what you have to give. Maybe talents or money or time. But if you can be greedy and you can focus on yourself and just want more and more and more, the enemy is winning against you. And so the best way to fight back against the enemy is to love and to give. Jesus put it like this in Luke chapter 12, beware, be on guard against every form of greed, for not even when one has an abundance does his life consist in his possessions. America has a greed problem. I have a greed problem, and it's just not with money. It could be with anything. You just want more of it, something that you collect, something that you have, something that you do, a hobby that takes your time, your money, and your worship away from God. Greed is an issue, and it is Satan's tool that he uses and leverages and works against us. There has to be a balance of the things that we have. And so Jesus himself is saying, watch out. Be aware. The enemy is working against you. Number four, sexual sin. We struggle in our culture with sexual sin. It is at our fingertips, literally, if we want it. Sexual sin is any form of sex that goes beyond God's intended boundaries, or it contradicts his design. Let me share this with you. Satan is a pervert. And I use that word as it actually is. He is perverted. He wants to twist and warp anything that God has made to be good and holy. And he wants to get you to believe that that is actually good, the twisted, manipulated form of it. He wants to redefine sex. Sex is just a meaningless act for your own selfish gain. It's about what pleases you. And so one of the things that our culture confronts is you have sex with your partner before you get married. you got to figure out if it's going to work. And if it doesn't work out sexually for you, then you move on and you find something that gratifies you. Well, not only does that violate God's word and his teaching for our life, but it leaves us feeling empty. 
Sex is just a small aspect to our relationship. It is just a tiny little sliver to what our relationships have to offer. It is not a tool to be used for our own selfish gain. It is something that should be celebrated between us, where we are trying to please our other spouse and God. But look at what Satan has done to sex. He has redefined it to be a selfish act. He cheapens it. He makes it something just that you spend with whoever you want, and it doesn't really matter anymore. He has made the beauty and the gift of sex nothing. And in that, he defies the designer. He also redesigns it. He doesn't only redefine it, he redesigns, he redesigns it. Sex doesn't mean unity of the heart and the soul. It's a selfish, self-satisfying act for your own personal gain. It makes sex just about us, and when we redesign what sex actually is, we are saying, this isn't for us, this is for me. And a person who is selfish sexually in a relationship is going to ruin the relationship. But that is the battle that we face. The redefining of sex, the redesigning of sex. Who cares if it damages the other person's body? It pleases me, this is what I want. Who cares if it makes them sick? Who cares if this sexual relationship causes them to lose seven to eight years on their lifespan? It's not about them. It's about what pleases me. Who cares if it destroys their mental stability? Who cares if it takes advantage of someone who is too young or maybe somebody who is too old? It's not about them. Sex is about me. And this is the great tool of Satan. He used the same methods in Ephesus when they worshiped the goddess Diana And he uses the same methods today when we worship ourselves. Be aware. Recognize the battle. Be on guard. And don't be fooled by your enemy, Satan. He is real. And so, can you see his theme? What's his theme when it comes to waging war against you? It's to make life about you or me. False doctrine. This is what I believe to be true materialism. These things matter most to me. Greed. I want more, more, more sex. What do I get out of it? And so if we will recognize the battleground, we can start to fight back. And that's what the next several weeks are going to be over. How do we fight back? What tools has God given us? I mean, Satan, he has tools that he uses, but what has God given us that we can stand and fight back against him with? You know, my sister and I, we used to fight all the time. She was kind of like a dude. (laughs) She played football, all right? She would lay people out. She was was a guard on the offensive line. So I had a formidable opponent in my childhood. And my sister and I, we would fight. One time, I was chasing her up the stairs because she messed with me, and she just heel kicked me right in the face. One time, we were fighting. She grabbed a deer antler and whacked me on the back of the head with it. We, we, we had like 20 babysitters. <laughs> we were awful. My sister was always willing to grab whatever around us, what was ever around us, and she would use that tool to fight me and fight back. Well, we have tools. Satan has his tools, but we have ours. We know that we win the war, but each of us is in our own battle. And not everyone faces the same battle. Some of it is greed. Some of it is sex. Some of it is materialism. Some of it is false doctrine. Some people struggle with drug addictions. Whatever your battle is, recognize the battlefield and then ready yourself. And here's here's the deal. If we fail to accept that we are in a battle, we are being schemed against by the devil and we run the risk of falling into his trap. And we miss out on winning the war because we never focused on fighting this battle. And so I will end with where I started. What should we do? Ephesians chapter 6, verses 10 through 12. Finally, be strong in the Lord and in the strength of his might. Put on the full armor of God, which is what we're going to talk about in the next couple weeks, so that you will be able to stand firm against the schemes of the devil. For our struggle is not against flesh and blood, but against rulers and powers, against the world forces of darkness, against the spiritual forces of wickedness and the heavenly places. You're in a spiritual war. Last week, you were in a spiritual war against your own flesh. This coming month, you're at war with your enemy, the devil. And the question is, do you want to win?